Grand Assembly, Committee Room 29. I now declare the meeting open to the public. Maybe one of these days somebody will come. On Lake Health, we used to pour it. <laughs> pour it, yeah. Pour it. <laughs> okay, I'll just read the thing. Uh, advising the members of those in the public glory that they're welcome to use their mobile devices as long as they're in airplane mode and all devices are muted. They connect to the assembly. Uh, they can accept to the assembly Wi-Fi. Password details are available in the gallery rules. And it's not permitted to take photographs or record any of the meeting. Uh, members can ensure that your electronic devices are switched to mute mode to ensure quality of sound recording. If members are con content, I'll proceed through the agenda as followed, uh, follows. Apologies, as uh, um, Paul said he was going to be in on later, was he? Yeah, it's going to be later. Okay. Uh, no other apologies? Okay. Uh, members, do we have any interest to declare during the session? Item 6. Item 6. You are working with an older version of the oh, we've got an update. Uh, Item 7. And can we go to the draft minutes on the 5th of February 2020? Members, can you all those meeting on the minutes are at page 5? Uh, are we content with the draft minutes and are they an accurate record of proceedings? Great. All those in favour say aye. 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 Happy to be published on the website. Aye. aye. Okay. Matters arising, Budget Bill Northern Ireland 2020. Uh, to draw the members' attention to a letter at page 17 from the Minister laying out the plans for introduction of the Budget Bill uh, Northern Ireland 2020 on the 24th of February 2020 and is seeking royal assent by the 31st of March, uh, providing the Committee for Finance's content, content to, ex to accelerate passage. Um, Jim, can you talk about this? Or which, which one do you want to do about this? Oh, I think I've that included. Oh, have you? Yeah, okay, well, fair enough. Um, I would draw members' attention to a briefing paper from the clerk that's tabled at page 3 regarding the Budget Bill and resource requirements. And I advise members that table correspondence agreed on the 5th of February as issued asking for information from all statutory committees on the budget and asking committees to agree to forward related information received from the departments and the ALBs to the Committee for F Finance. Uh, members, are we happy? Are we happy to note? Great. Uh, moving on to statutory rules, I'd like to draw members' attention to a clerk's briefing paper at page 19. Uh, just to the chair, page 19. Uh, that's the wrong date. This is the very first paragraph of the meeting on the 29th of February. Mm -hmm. uh, yes, sir. It certainly is. It should read the 29th of January. 29th of January. Well spotted. You get the prize for actually reading the minutes. Yeah. Excellent. Yeah. Hurrah! For my good, for my good. That's a good start. Yeah. <laughs> uh, on the 5th of February 2020, the committee agreed, subject to the examiner of statutory rules. The report had no objections to the listed statutory rules. Uh, the examiner of statutory rules has now reported on all these statutory rules and has no technical issues to raise. There were three statutory rules which the department broke the 21-day rule on, but the examiner was content with the explanations given. Uh, members, are we content to note? Thank you very much indeed. Noted. Uh, now moving into the oral evidence, overview and priorities and strategic <coughs> policy and reform director. Could I welcome sort of Bill Polly and could I welcome Tony Simpsons, respectively, strategic policy and reform directorate, uh, directorate and again uh, Tony Simpson, director of strategic policy division. Thank you very much indeed. Uh, I'd like to draw the members' attention to a briefing paper from the committee clerk at page 21 and a paper from the Department regarding key issues and priorities for Strategic Policy Reform Director at page 22. Gentlemen, could you uh, make your opening statement to the committee, please? And first of all, welcome. Thank you very much, Chair. Uh, and thank you for the opportunity to outline the role of the Director to you. Such an early stage. I appreciate it. Um, 
Strategic Policy and Reform Directorate uh, has an overall objective, as stated in paragraph one, is enabling and improving the effectiveness of public services through with four separate uh, divisions. Uh, a strategic policy division that Tony heads, public sector reform division, with the head of that's currently vacant, the <coughs> European division uh, that uh, Frank Duffy and our team heads, and we have an RHI inquiry sponsor branch. Uh, I've given in the short paper uh, three or four of what we see as the top priority strategic areas for the directorate, probably other areas that, that we do at a lower level. <coughs> But uh, we're happy to take questions and those, and uh, as the committee see fit uh, for it, all four of the directorates to outline what we do. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen. Mr. Ross. Yeah. Sir. Thanks, Steve. Thank you, Chair. Um, Jim, Jim, um, welcome. Uh, uh, it's it's it's, good. You, it's quite a lot in your division. Um, it would be helpful on the um, on EU policy if you could set out for us. Um, you, you said that there's a really helpful introduction in terms of structural spending. Two questions. One, um, can you give us a sense of how you interact with the executive office and its Brexit planning team and what that what that means in organisation and policy advice terms? <coughs> and two. Can you give us an update on where we are in terms of Peace Plus and um, you know, European spending going forward based on what was agreed in the withdrawal agreement? I've got, it's quite a big set of questions. <laughs> okay. Uh, no, we're happy to do it. I mean, the European Union division in the Department of Finance has a primary focus on the financial aspects of the relationship with the European Union uh, and essentially the spending power that uh, the executive and Northern Ireland departments have enjoyed uh, since we joined the European Union. We have for a long period coordinated those across all departments. Uh, it's not quite all now, but most departments have some form of a role in delivering part of the current European uh, programmes in relation to that. Uh, collectively, uh, the executive would have in the region of £500 million pounds a year of spending power from the current EU fund. Over the 2014 to 2020 period, it's about £4 billion. Pounds. So it's a significant sum uh, that we have had in, in terms of EU income. Uh, and the European Union division has a role in uh, assisting other departments and examining that other departments would meet the proper regulatory standards and that the claims to the European Commission for reimbursement of that expenditure uh, it, it are made in line with EU regulations and targets. Uh, so there's quite a financial focus to the role that it plays in relation to that. Uh, it, it partly comes to, I'll come back to the TEO question, uh, but the other part of the role of the department that comes out of that directorate then is we're the sponsor department for the SEUPB, mm -hmm. the North-South body. Yep. Good Friday Agreement in relation to that. It delivers the current peace and interreg programmes, both cross-border programmes, and has done so uh, since, uh, well, it's about the year 2000 after it was created after the 1998 agreement, uh, and it has done that. So we're the sponsor department for Northern Ireland, work with our colleagues in the public Department of Public Expenditure and Reform in the South, mm -hmm. uh, and would advise our minister and our executive in relation to the role of SEUPB in the delivery of those uh, particular programmes. That includes the Peace Plus programme that we're currently uh, in relation to uh, we're developing. Um, the Peace Plus programme is advancing. There is a current engagement process that SEUPB are leading uh, uh, across uh, Northern Ireland and the border counties uh, in, in relation to gathering views uh, from stakeholders and others in, in terms of what the programme content should be and might be. Uh, that's in line with our legislation that they have that role. Uh, they would then make proposals on what the future programme would look like to both sponsor departments uh, in, in relation to that. And we, our role in European division would be to 
uh, consider those, provide advice to the finance minister and through him to the executive on whether that proposals in the, that program were consistent with the executive's priorities and we would seek agreement of the executive with it in time. In terms of timing, SEUPB are gathering those proposals. We expect them uh, to produce first program proposals to us uh, late May, June. Uh, that would be a draft program. Uh, the Commission has asked for a first discussion of those proposals around that time, so we would agree that with, with Ministers before we have a discussion with each program proposals. It would probably be discussed at MSMC and also Ministers before we engage the Commission, and then we expect post-summer to have a statutory consultation period on the contents of the program so that it could be formally agreed towards the end of the year and passed to the Commission seeking a Commission decision agreement on the program. Mm -hmm. uh, our relationship with TEO, um, we have the other part, and it's, we've listed there, the future policy and finance uh, section. There's a short paragraph at the end. Uh, the, the executive office at, the, at this moment leads in all of the full extent of, of the executive's European policy and relationships with the European Union. Um, we have, during the Brexit preparations, uh, prepared for them uh, and led the working group that reports to their group on future policy and finance, where uh, it has been looking at what and how we might replace the spending power that we currently derive from the EU funds. We've worked across departments with that, uh, mostly DERA, DFE, infrastructure, uh, uh, and uh, a little bit of communities in, t in terms of the expenditure, in terms of what uh, policies we might need to put in place in order to uh, make our case uh, and uh, engage with Whitehall on the various replacement funds that Whitehall has described as replacing the EU. When, when, now that we've left the EU, there will be national funds created to replace the EU funding streams. There's also decisions to be taken on whether we will participate in some European programmes as a third country and there's a number of different proposals, and that's quite complex as to whether the UK <coughs> as a whole would decide to participate in the programme, therefore Treasury would pay for it, mm -hmm. or for some there is the possibility uh, that they could say Northern Ireland may wish to participate in that, go ahead, uh, but you can pay the contribution to Europe. They would be required to support. Just that. to intervene slightly there, and sorry, sort of cut across here, Matthew. One of the things that in the discussions that took place before the reformation of the Northern Ireland Assembly and the Executive was the discussion about the delta that was going to be caused by Northern Ireland leaving the European Union and the costings and the costing level. And there was an, there was a presumption that there would be additional funding to coming to Northern Ireland from Treasury for this, and that degree of discussion had already taken place. From what I've just heard from you, and bearing in mind we're now at ten and a half months and counting, I don't detect that there's any been more detail being placed on that, or has uh, there been more detailed work that we're not aware of? That's a slightly different area, Chair, if, if I might ask. Uh, what I've been talking about is the replacement of the current EU funding schemes. There is a European Regional Development Fund. Yeah, that was that was all that was all there part of that was all part of the uh, no, that work went, was ongoing all through the past two, three years, really, from the, the, the vote to leave the European Union as we began to examine the implications of that. Um, the other work that uh, you're referring to was really there was work done uh, to uh, prepare for a possible no deal exit yeah. from the European Union, and there was uh, mitigations in terms of what we would do if there was no deal and the, the, uh, we worked with other departments uh, who <coughs> uh, quantified 
the type of impacts that leaving with no deal might have on Northern Ireland and its economy in particular. And hence the reason we got the thirty million reduced and reduction the, the, or the, the, reduced from uh, <coughs> agriculture and a few other areas. The, yeah. the funding package sought was to mitigate the impacts of no deal to have economic interventions substantially going to be through Department of Agriculture and through Department for the Economy and their arms length bodies that would help mitigate a no deal Brexit. That was that ran alongside our work to seek to fully replace the European funding that we also get from Treasury, uh, or that we get from Europe, but uh, the spending power that we enjoy from that comes from the EU income that we get. It is financed from the EU income, not from the Northern Ireland bloc. Okay. Could you just give us an outline of what the quantum of that is, what you're, what you're looking at, figure? I'd indicate that's over the 2014 to 2020 period, that's around €4 billion, Euro, and uh, you divide by seven, whatever exchange rate of the day, and you get around half a billion a year in, in expenditure. It varies with exchange rates, it varies from year to year, there's fluctuations in, in that. Do if I could just... Yeah, oh, yeah, sorry. Thank you, Steve. Thanks, sir. Um, so that was the what's called the multi-annual financial framework period, fourteen to twenty. That's right. We're now in negotiations, or the, well, we're not. The, the, the people who are still yes. in the EU are in negotiations for um, twenty-one to twenty-seven. The note on peace, the note that you helpfully provided the committee, said current proposals, <clears throat> as in current proposals based on discussions that have happened between UK Irish governments and the EU are that the proposals to the proposals presumably from the EU budget to replace lost funding are around 650 million euro is that 650 million euro versus what was 4 billion well not that's no. 4 billion sterling that's no that's only peace plus that's only peace plus yeah and there will be other structural and the, the current peace programs yeah and interreg program yeah. combined in round numbers okay. in pounds not euro uh, are roughly the same size as what the proposed current proposal for peace peace right, plus okay. would be. So it's peace They're plus an indirect just thing. Under three hundred million. Yeah. Okay. There, so that that is a <coughs> that across the sort of profile of the MFF period is kind of a prox is not a million miles from where it was in four, from in the fourteen to twenty. The years. size of that program won't be there. It will be financed slightly differently. Uh, the current. Uh, Peace and interreg programmes are financed roughly on the basis uh, that the UK's contribution from our European funds allocation is about three quarters of both peace and interregs programme, and the Ireland contribution represents about a quarter in round numbers uh, in, in relation to that. After the UK U leaves the European Union, the amount of money that is the current Commission proposal to the multi-annual financial framework is for €120 million Euro over the seven period that would come from the European Commission budget. The UK Government announced, uh, forget the exact date, uh, it's about a year, year and a half ago, uh, Karen Bradley announced that the UK Government would provide their contribution to the programme of approximately £300 million. Uh, so the £300 million plus Europe's 120 plus the matched funding that we would have to provide from Northern Ireland's own budget brings those two programmes to roughly the same level. The withdrawal agreement bill makes a specific reference to this. It says that the programmes will continue at roughly the same level and in the same proportions as now in order to preserve predominantly the role of the North-South body uh, in, in delivering uh, the Good Friday Agreement and the aspects of NSMC that were prevalent throughout the discussions between Europe and the UK and reflected in uh, the different stages of the bills that were produced there, that, that that would be replaced. Okay. You happy, Matt? Okay. Jim? Uh, yeah, Trevor Jim. Yeah, Mr. Paul, it's good to see you again. It's a long time since our paths first crossed. 
Yes, when I was an MEP and you were the go-to man in the department on all things EU. Um, two or three items I want to raise with you. The paper you provided us, paragraph 28, says that the department has been leading work on the revision of the codes governing the conduct and behaviour of ministers, special advisors in the civil service and associated material as reflected in the new decade new approach agreement. The special advisor codes and associated documents are in place. Others will follow shortly. I want to focus you particularly on the ministerial code because when we go to the minister's first day brief, it says there, Strength and codes of conduct, ministerial, civil service and special advisor have been prepared. Drafts are ready to take to the executive committee for implementation. The question therefore is, where is the ministerial code at? Uh, the work to take that firstly to, uh, to the executive and to seek the approvals for it going in place is at quite an advanced stage, I would hope that the executive would consider that in the coming weeks. But the minister was told on his first day brief the drafts are ready. We're now, what, a month on? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And they still haven't got to the executive. What's the issue? Uh, there is no issue other than timing and the preparing of these. Uh, the special advisor I'm talking about the ministerial yes. code. They were taken first because of the immediacy of the need to appoint special advisors and to have those arrangements in place. Uh, the other codes are currently going the, through the process of where they are finalised within our own department uh, and then at the stage where they are being circulated to... So is the ministerial code contrary to what the first day brief said, not yet finalised uh, within the department? It, it will not be finalised until it has all of the agreements that it will need before it can be put in place. It could yet, in the process of discussion uh, by the Minister's executive colleagues, have comments or amendments or changes that would have to be agreed across the executive uh, before any Final version. I understand that. that. It could go to the executive and the executive could say we want that changed or this changed, yes. etc. But it hasn't got to that point, has it? Uh, it has been circulated to executive colleagues. Has it? It has. Mm -hmm. Can I take you to paragraph? Sorry, two? just a just second. Has it, Bill? Yes. When was that? When was that? Uh, last Thursday or Friday, I am not sure. Which of I see. Are there any legal issues holding it up? Uh, no. Uh, ultimately, the ministerial code is, as you will know, mm -hmm. part of the North Ireland Act. Yeah. And uh, after executive agreement, there would be a process required that will amend. Uh, I should say what we're talking about here is the Ministerial Code of Conduct, yes. which is a part of the overall Ministerial Code. Yes. There are no proposals to amend uh, like the Pledge of Office or the parts of the Ministerial Code that uh, would be in terms of ministerial responsibilities uh, to the Executive or to the Pursuit or to the east-west structures that all form part of the ministerial code itself. But there will be legislation that would be required to put ministerial code amendments in place. The legislation in the Assembly or in Westminster? Uh, we have advice that that is possible by the Assembly, uh, but some other legal advice as well to say that we we need to check uh, at this moment <coughs> to determine whether or not uh, as primary legislation it may have to be Westminster. Is the Attorney General given advice? Uh, I have seen advice from the Attorney General. 
Busy being a judge, it looks bad looking. All right. <laughs> so the Attorney General has raised issues about the Ministerial Code and the capacity of Stormont to change it. Is that fair? Uh, he has given advice on that issue. Yeah. Uh, <clears throat> we have also had advice from our Departmental Solicitor's Office. And do the devices conflict? Um, I'm not sure that they conflict, but they're not precisely the same. <laughs> That's a very similar answer. <laughs> That's brilliant. Thank you, Sir, <laughs> Sir Humphrey. <laughs> um, just a quick one, Paul. You've sorry lost for your no way. You haven't lost any of your way with words, Mr. Paul. Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, sorry, just for cutting across you there, uh, Jim. Just a quick one. Spad's code. Yes. Um, we were told it was imminent, and this process of it being brought forward by the minister before it came before this committee for information was because it was needed to be done with a degree of haste and urgency. And now we're one month on, and we still haven't seen the SPADS code, and we still haven't seen any announcement yet on sort of uh, appointment of SPADS <coughs> and their, uh, what's within the code. What's happening there? I think, sure, we've seen the codes. We haven't heard the, the announcement. The SPAD code has yeah. been published. Yeah. Uh, the, uh, along with the code of appointment, uh, the code of <coughs> appointment and uh, the draft letter of appointment, all of that detail mm -hmm. has been published and is on the website. Uh, what we haven't yet seen is the announcement of the SPADs to be appointed, appointed and uh, the pay point for those SPADs. And that's been delayed more than once. Is that right? Uh, the work, we're, the it work indicated it would be the week before last, and the, it'll be new, last week the, newsletter, the newsletter has reported that it has been delayed oh. uh, more Sounds than like once. A good source we, to me. We have been working through uh, with the appointment process of SPADs in order to uh, receive from uh, all departments the nominee that the minister wants to appoint. Uh, uh, we. Uh, didn't get the final one of those until uh, a few days ago in relation to that and there is the process then that must follow of all of them would based in terms of what was published they need to be uh, considered and appointed to one of the pay bands and the salary within that and then we would have to uh, publish the list of SPADs who have been appointed and their salaries as we have committed to do. So is it at this stage? We have commitments to that as we publish that information we would have to publish the average salary yes. of all of the SPADs, which we can't do until we have all of them <coughs> and the salaries agreed. And we would have to publish the annual pay bill uh, uh, for SPADs and again you know, we need to know all of the details for all of the SPADs before we can put <coughs> that information with the names together. Sounds like you might need a special advisor to do all that. Mm. Um, but, uh, Jerry, that took a little longer than I thought, but paragraph 24, uh, SPD advise and support the Minister in progressing his priorities with respect to additional fiscal powers. It is expected that key priorities for the year ahead will include supporting the Minister in A, the establishment of a fiscal commission. commission. Yeah. Tell us a little bit about this fiscal commission that the Minister anticipates. Well, the, 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 the Minister has indicated that he wants to look at the, the, the levers that are available to the Executive and to the Assembly. So that idea didn't come from the Civil Service? Uh, it was announced by the Minister now mm -hmm. in the past. Um, the, in various agreements, economic pact and fresh start and, and, and so on, um, there were elements of those agreements which indicated that we, or the executive, would look to what additional powers that uh, <coughs> would have. The minister has indicated that he he is interested in looking at establishing a commission to consider what powers might be appropriate to uh, to seek. And would this be commission have statutory powers or? Would it be established by statute, or how would it be established? Well, we're, con we're, we're currently considering options, of it, as you'll be aware. Um, no doubt that there were commissions that were established uh, in relation in Scotland. Would it be a royal and commission that the minister would be appointing? Uh, we haven't got to that point yet, so we're looking at the processes 
um, that have uh, been gone through in Wales and in Scotland to see what lessons we can learn about how we could or we could establish such a commission, um, what its terms of reference might be, uh, the, like, the, the type of expertise and the people that might be involved. Um, but we're concer currently considering options and have yet to put advice to the Minister on that. So this is a fiscal commission in very much skeleton form, no real flesh on the bones at all, either as to its statutory form, its powers, or the binding nature of any recommendations it would make? Yeah, as I say, we're, we're, we're still examining that at the moment. Mm. Tony, are we thinking along the lines of an OBR? Well, that would be that's slightly separate. So there's there's two issues here. So there's the, the fiscal council, which was uh, referenced in in the, the the new decade new approach agreement. Mm. So that's distinct. So that the, there's elements of the agreement which are uh, suggesting that that would prefer uh, provide assessments of the executive's finance. That is akin to an OBR type organisation, and their counterparts in Scotland have, mm. uh, and and in the Irish Republic. Um, but what. Uh, Mr. Alice has referred to as a commission, which is actually looking at what powers we may, uh, the executive, might seek to either devolve or whether there's new fiscal levers that Northern Ireland could consider whether or not they should establish. Uh, uh, finally, could I take you to paragraph? Sorry. Sorry. If it's the same issue, is it? Is no, it? could I just ask to the chair, what's an OBR? Oh, sir, oh. Office of Budget Responsibility. Sorry. Sorry, I apologise, Mike. Thank you. Um, could it, finally, could I take it to paragraph 10, Mr. Bowie? Third sentence is about the Shared Prosperity Fund. Because of this lack of clarity, our focus has been on maximising the funding allocations to the north. Where's that? Donegal, obviously. Alan Head. Um, <coughs> to Northern Ireland. To Northern Ireland. Why does it not say that? Uh, this is the language. Uh, the Minister, this document, as we are here today, we are appearing on behalf of the Minister. This document uh, was cleared by the Minister for forwarding to uh, th this committee. So did the Minister require you to deploy Republican speak? Uh, the, the language to be used in the Department uh, does come from the Minister's office. Is there a directive to that effect? Uh, there is not a written directive. Uh, the documents that we present to private office uh, are uh, written and drafted in, in a way uh, that would reflect how previous documents might have been changed after we had them there previously. Uh, and we would reflect uh, it, if a certain language is changed in one submission or one type of thing as as would come. We as officials would pick up on the style and tone of what our minister wants and we'd try to present material to him that would be agreed uh, by his office uh, for onward forward in the committee without so, so what you're saying is within uh, this I think uh, Jim I think well uh, I think that the I think the official has made it clear that they don't have much option in this particular one going well I think forward. I think it is worthy of comment that uh, in this the thought police of the private office tell civil servants such as yourself what language they can use and they can only use Republican speak when it comes to Northern Ireland correct yes. Is that, isn't that a fair summary? Mm -hmm. No, that's not... Well, then, did you say the North, or did that's you...? That's not... Uh, this, this is a document that is presented to this committee on behalf of the Minister. Who's a Minister that, that, of Northern Ireland, but cannot dare to speak its name. Us, us appearing before this committee, we do so on behalf of our Minister, and we act under his direction. So, Jim, I think... Pretty Stalinist, isn't it, Mr...? Sorry, Jim, Bob. I think, Jim, the point has been made... I fully appreciate your. I fully appreciate the point, but I think the point has been made. Uh, can we move on, Gemma? Thanks, Chair. Um, under the OHA Inquiry Sponsorship Team, um, how many people are on this team, and what has been the cost of the inquiry so far? Uh, two people. Okay. Have been working in relation to it. Uh, we of course sponsor the inquiry. 
which means that we have oversight of the budget of the team that is based in support of Sir Patrick, wholly independently from us, outside of the department, and working for the inquiry in which we would uh, work to agree that in, in relation to it. Uh, in terms of the cost of the inquiry so far, our understanding is that Sir Patrick will publish that alongside his report. In terms of what his costs have been, uh, and we await the final version of the total costs of the inquiry that will be published alongside the report when he makes it on 13th of March. In relation to that, uh, we in the department have had some uh, additional costs in terms of legal costs of the inquiry uh, that have also recently been published in relation to it, as had. Uh, other departments in relation to that. Uh, those costs in total are in the, uh, of the legal costs are in the region of five million, which will be on the top of uh, the inquiry costs that Sir Patrick will publish okay. alongside his report. Okay. Thank you. Sure. Thanks, Chair. Back to the Pace Plus uh, bill. Will it be in similar in nature to the previous uh, funding and application process? Will that all be similar to previous funding? Uh, it, I think the first answer is yes. There will be parts of, of the Peace Plus programme that reflect the previous programme. But uh, everyone in developing the programme and in considering it in departments here and departments in the south and in stakeholders have been asked to think about uh, how they might develop their work, do it a bit differently, make it more effective, make it more appropriate to the next seven years rather than the last seven years. Uh, but uh, you know, there are some elements of the programme that we expect to be in the Peace Plus programme that are in the current programmes. Uh, in relation to either its target groups or in relation to the nature of the funding uh, that goes out. But it won't be exactly the same. Yeah. We hope it will reflect the next seven years for, uh, and some of that will develop previous bits. There will be some new bits, I imagine. don't know exactly what programme will be agreed yet, for example. Uh, but uh, there are people coming forward with and, and suggesting during the SEUPB's current engagement process other things, other ways and other approaches that might be done. And when would you see this up and running, uh, Bill, completely? Uh, we have to submit, the Commission has asked us to work towards uh, submitting a final programme towards the end of this year. Uh, and we are currently working to that timetable. Uh, that said, uh, the Commission has not yet agreed, had its budget for the next seven years agreed. No. It is not likely to be finalised perhaps until the June European Council meeting, uh, and maybe not even then. Uh, it, it, that's completely out of our hands now yeah. uh, in relation to it. It will only be at the time the European budget is agreed that we know finally the European allocation to Peace Plus, and so yeah. whether it will be the size that we're predicting to you today. So that could change the timing of the agreement of the Structural Fund programme across Europe, but including the Peace Plus programme. Just one final one, uh, Chair. In terms of the Brexit executive subgroup, so what's your role there? Just reporting to it? Our, or? Our, yes, a reporting role. Our minister sits on the yeah. Brexit executive subgroup. Uh, we brief him uh, for the papers the, that come to that in terms of where there would be a Department of Finance interest in that. Uh, there is uh, that group has a number of work streams to it, one of which is the future policy and finance work stream, uh, for which I'm the SRO, and for which uh, we provide briefing and advice to the Minister as to how that will be taken forward. And we will be taking papers on the work of that work stream to 
the Brexit subgroup uh, at one of its forthcoming meetings. It, it has had first outlines of some of the financial issues in relation to it, but it hasn't had a detailed paper yet in terms of what some of those issues might be, how they might be taken. Yes, sir. Okay. Um, just a, sort of a final point, just before we sort of let you go. Oh, sorry. Pat's oh, Pat, sorry, Pat. Sorry. Thanks very much, Chair. So I'm um, just was uh, wandering down. I'm looking at the, the at the Brexit subcommittee and the capital costs, and I'm taking in mind the uh, Northern Ireland Protocol. Can you tell us the circumstances of this negative income income on the consequences and how much you think? those projected costs are going to be? And in simpler terms, what way do you find that that will affect ourselves and our standing as we find, as we move forward over the next year, taking in mind that there's no figure there at the moment that you're able to tell us? Uh, we have no idea of the potential scale of, of those costs. Uh, Committee may have seen or may have know the this very much depends what type of free trade deal or the nature of that will be uh, between the UK and the EU. Uh, it depends whether uh, the Prime Minister's promise that we would have unfettered access uh, and he has promised uh, as part of the new decade uh, new approach document that there would be legislation to ensure that unfettered access. If we get unfettered access, there would be no negative well, yeah, well, the costs to do with well, Just to cut across you slightly, Pat, Sorry, but uh, I don't think many don't. people in this committee here have got much faith in sort of yeah, Boris Johnson's approach. So uh, what's the contingencies? That's it. That's <laughs> um, <laughs> it, it, it. It does depend how fettered any unfettered access might turn out to be as to what, what implication that might have on businesses here. That has been examined in detail uh, and research carried out uh, by Department for the Economy colleagues uh, in terms of the trade implications, and they're looking at it in terms of uh, trade Northern Ireland to GB and trade GB to Northern Ireland uh, in relation to that as to uh, whether and what possible uh, restrictions or tariffs or costs that might emerge for businesses and consumers in order to determine what they might be. If, if such issues do exist, uh, we would want to carry further research to uh, determine the impact that that might have on business and what possible measures might be put in place to support businesses or consumers uh, in responding to that. And if you like, that would be a policy that the executive would put in place to try to overcome those. And such a scheme or such interventions would have a cost. Yeah. Um, and have you any idea? I mean, have we, I mean, we don't. I know it's all difficult, but I mean, this is, it's coming at us fairly fast now. And I mean, I need to know: is there a contingency plan, or is there planning going on? Is there anything you could share with this committee? I have Mr. not. Bola, I have not yet have seen any numbers in relation to what that might be. There has been uh, some estimates. Uh, of whether it would, if, if there is uh, restrictions on trade as to, for example, how much the economy might shrink by, but that is not the same as to what it would cost us in terms of putting measures in place that might potentially overcome those um, in relation to that. There is the other side of it uh, in, in relation to uh, whether we could position Northern Ireland as being a gateway to both the UK and to Europe, and as to whether there may be benefits from that. That too might have costs for the schemes and actions and initiatives that we would put in place. But all of that is hugely dependent on what deal the UK 
and Europe uh, might put in place in terms of whether by the end of the year or not. Um, and there would be, uh, have not yet got contingencies for the end of this year. Mm -hmm. We had contingency plans for a no-deal Brexit. Mm -hmm. uh, those plans um, can, I'm going to say maybe for the most part, but can in part uh, be amended and adjusted to adop adopt and be put in place for a possible no free, no free trade deal scenario and what measures might be put in place to try to respond to any negative implications. Should we have negative implications? Um, the First and Deputy First Minister have written to the Prime Minister, have written to ask that he uh, delivers on his commitment that there would be unfettered access and that he would legislate for that. And yeah, can I ask just a little bit of you yourself, Mr. Polly, with your vast experience, um, how frightened may you well be uh, going forward for where we are here in Northern Ireland? I mean, I'm looking at uh, a percentage. I mean, you might, you know, of a of a downward trend. Yes, we may well be able to, if we get that unfettered access and guaranteed across both European and United Kingdom, but what in the worst case scenario? All right. The downturn? The, the, the downturn <coughs> in the economy, the estimates, the latest estimates that I can recall from the Department for the Economy would be that our economy could potentially shrink by uh, or, or have a negative consequence of around 3%. Uh, That's a, thank you, Matthew. The, just one more. There are lots of caveats to how that number is <laughs> reached. Um, the question I wanted to ask is related to that. What, since the <clears throat> still new government was re-elected in December, since the new UK government what, uh, has come into place, how have your and, and also obviously you've got an assembly and executive restarted? How is <coughs> you know, the Northern Department's report, not reporting lines, but interaction with Whitehall changed? Who are you? Is it we're talking to now? Is it all going? Is it all going through the executive office to cabinet office, or I'm just interested <coughs> to know how that central negotiating function is happening? Because we've obviously had the Department of Exit and European Union is no more as of the end of January, um, but we know from the outside, someone who used to work on Whitehall seems slightly, um, slightly hard to discern where the departmental responsibility lies, other than in a relatively small group in the cabinet office. Can you shed any light? Uh, I think. The broad rule of thumb is really that TEO would be leading to and have led discussions that have been with uh, DXU when it existed. Uh, where DXU no longer exists, some of those discussions have been replaced by discussions with Cabinet Office, and they would typically lead, the TEO would typically lead the discussions mm -hmm. that go there. Uh, the discussions that we would have would normally be with Treasury. Mm -hmm. uh, DOF leads in the relationship with that, mm -hmm. and uh, the discussions uh, we would have with Treasury would relate to implications that the policy side in Whitehall and the policy side here, we would focus on obviously financial discussions with yeah. Treasury. Yeah. Thanks very much. Sir. Look, just before um, we finish up, and thank you very much, one of the big questions we've obviously had is around about the issues of public sector pay. And we noted in uh, 21, uh, paragraph 21, you're talking to the University of Ulster about the Economic uh, Policy Centre. And obviously, one of the things that's been one of the big questions has been on pay parity. So, one of the questions I'd like to know is when are we going to get some sort of results on this study? Because obviously, the questions of pay parity are of considerable interest to the unions and where we're likely to be. And the second one is that uh, one of the discussions we've been having quite a lot with sort of uh, some armed things bodies and other sort of uh, organisations uh, is the fact of the issue around holiday pay and the quantum that that's likely to be. Can you give us an indication of what that quantum is and how we're going to manage it? Uh, if, I, if I start, sure, on the, the University of Ulster work, 
Um, as it says in the brief that that work is being finalised, our uh, intention is that the, that will be published to inform the consideration and engagement around the budget. Um, so my hope would be that, that the publication of that work is imminent. So what, uh, next week? Uh, in, in time frame of a yeah, matter of weeks, <coughs> let's be specific, we're still working through the detail of timings on the budget engagement. Okay. I think we can say we will send it to the committee just at the point uh, of the, to the, in terms of before it would be published. And that, would, would be that would be, we would be mm -hmm. very gratefully received any information ahead of uh, actually reading about it on the BBC website. Mm -hmm. And that, the holiday pay, we do not have a precise number that we could quote to you that we could stand over in a way that would be precise. There are a huge number of uncertainties across each of the different staff groups across the public sector uh, in relation uh, to that. Uh, the, some groups have quantified them in different ways. The, obviously, the police service have a number that is based on the actual claimants and those who have come forward to lodge a claim with the tribunal within that uh, in relation to uh, Hmm. Any other potential future cost, uh, the PSNI have, of course, appealed mm -hmm. uh, to, to the Supreme Court, which and it is currently deciding whether it will hear that. Uh, and we don't know that yet or where it might be. So depending on the outcome of whether any parts of that or no parts of that appeal, there's a, a range of scenarios as to what the implications of the holiday pay. So you must have modelled what... The worst case scenario is because obviously um, if the Supreme Court doesn't allow this to go forward there's going to be a substantial bill and you must have modelled that. Yes. How much? Uh, the maximum figure, again it's a range, I would say up to around 200 million. 200 million. Chair, could I ask one question? Sure. Um, has the department got a date when it, the department expects to receive the RHI report? Uh, no. Uh, we have been in discussion uh, with the inquiry. They have told us we will receive an advance copy of the report. Uh, I understand uh, they have suggested to is that that might be 24 hours. Uh, we uh, had hoped and had and have asked uh, if that could be perhaps 48. But we, uh, it, it will be in that sort of... And had you any discussion touching upon the date of publication? No. Uh, we, when I say have we had any, we have asked the inquiry for their projection. Yes, but we've, been, we've all now been told it's the 13th of March. Yes, but had you any you part in setting that date? No, we we have, but we have frequently said to them, "What date do you think it will be published?" Yes, mm -hmm. but have had no, made no attempt to say you should finish it by or we. Oh yes, uh, or any aspect okay. of that whatsoever. Okay, Bill, thank Tony, you. thank you very much indeed, and thank you very much indeed for uh, coming and giving your evidence. Uh, uh, members of the committee, if there's any further information as requested in relation to this uh, strategic policy uh, director, we'll uh, have it passed on to you. But thank you very much indeed, and uh, look forward to talking to you frequently. Thank, thank you. you. Cheers. Uh, Chair, just again to, uh, through the Chair, can I ask that when people do make uh, presentations, but in the event of them using that paper, that they would tell us what they actually mean. All right, so the acronyms, yeah. Quite frequently, and they just assume that. The rest of us are as informed as maybe some of the more long-standing members yep. of this assembly. But uh, ladies and gentlemen, please. Sir, ladies, please. <laughs> Thank you.
And uh, I welcome, to, welcome the Pensions Division to come to the uh, in front of the uh, Finance Committee. Can I welcome you, Grace, let me get this right, for Director of Pensions Division, Margaret, uh, Head of Civil Service Communications Policy and Legislation Branch, uh, Colette, Head of Civil Service Operations Branch, and Blainard, uh, Head of Public Service Policy and Legislation Branch. I would like to draw the members' attention to a briefing paper from the committee, which is page 32, and a briefing paper from the department regarding key issues and priorities of the pensions provisions for page 34. Can I ask you to, once you've uh, taken your ease, if you could make your opening statement, please. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Chair. Um, I'm sorry I was unavailable when my colleagues came on the 29th of January and briefed the committee about the statutory rules made by the department since January 2017. I do, however, welcome for the opportunity to come today to provide members of the committee with an overview of the work and priorities of the Pension Division. I thought it would be helpful to advise members what I will not be covering before I tell you what I am going to be covering. Firstly, in terms of the structure of departments, which are made up of directorates and divisions, Pension Division, which I lead, is part of Enterprise Shared Services Directorate. I will not be covering any aspects of the work of the wider directorate, Just which mentioned. includes finance and HR shared services, digital shared services, properties division, central government transformation programme, reform of property management programme, and network and information systems regulator. Members will receive a briefing from my colleagues in Enterprise Shared Services in early March on these areas. I'm sure you're very glad to know I'm not covering all those areas. Mm. Secondly, regarding types of pensions, I am not responsible for state pension. That is dealt with by the Department for Communities, nor will I cover private sector pensions. That is dealt with by the Department for the Economy. So what's left, you might be thinking? <laughs> well, quite a lot. It is, of course, public service pensions, which is what my division deals with. And I'm sure from reading the paper provided in advance of this evidence session that members may already have formed the view that public service pensions are quite complex enough anyway, without having any other sector added. That is definitely my view. Mm. So I will try and explain some of the pension terms as I go through this session and avoid using jargon. And if I do, just take, a note, just take a note of it and ask one of my very learned colleagues to explain when I finish speaking. Definitely don't ask me. So Pensions Division has two distinct roles. It deals with the policy and primary legislation for all public service pension schemes in Northern Ireland, which my colleague Blanad uh, is responsible for and everything else to deal with one of the public service pension schemes, the civil service pension scheme, and um, the other civil service pension uh, associated schemes, which Margaret Coyle deals with and Colette Heaney deals with. So the structure of this, of this presentation, just to outline it, I'll deal with an overview of civil service pensions and then the public service pensions policy and legislation, followed by the key priorities associated with both. In the interest of time, because I realise this committee has a lot to deal with and to take in, I'm not going to cover every item that I included in the briefing, given the diverse nature of our work and the remit, but I'm just going to pick up on the key salient points. First, I'm going to cover civil service pension schemes and their arrangements. Members will have read from the briefing that I provided some of the key facts about the civil service pension scheme, so I'm not going to repeat them all here, but just provide some background generally on our pension arrangements, which I trust will be helpful contacts for members, because I'm sure, like my colleagues before me, I will also be back before this committee again on a number of occasions. Suffice to say that we have over 70,000 members, and the split is gradually changing, and we've seen our membership change as our pension members grow. And currently, we have about 30,000 members who are pensioners, and our active workforce is shrinking, and it has reduced. And we've also got 30,000 active members and 10,000 members who have left the scheme for whatever reason and have not yet joined their members, and we call those deferred members. And the option of partial retirement, where people work some of their time and are retired for part of their time, has proved really popular. And with nearly 2,000 members in that category, we've taken up that option. 
which means that they are both active, as I say, the, the partial members and um, pensioner members as well. And um, that's very attractive. And to be a, a, a partially retired member, you have to at least work um, four days a week and then be a pensioner for, for one day a week. There are two main pension schemes. The pre-2015 principal service pension scheme, which includes the original classic arrangement, which is what's known as a final salary pension scheme. And there are about 7,000 people in that. And it's, it's a closed pension scheme. That means nobody else can join it. And the scheme retirement age is 60 for the classic member. You can work on past that age, but, it's, but you, can't, you can lift your pension when you're, when you're 60. Um, and that's the age that you can lift your pension without having any reduction in it. And that's called uh, without having any accrual reduction. And the pension that you get if you're in the classic scheme is based on the best 12 months of your pensionable pay in the last three years of what's called reckonable service. And the classic scheme also includes an automatic lump sum, and that's three times your pensionable pay. And members can what's called commute, and that means you can just take less pension and take an additional lump sum up to the limit set by HMRC. And there's different arrangements in the classic scheme, just to hopefully not confuse you even more. Um, it also includes just slightly different variations known as classic bus premium and also the Nuvis arrangement which was introduced in 2002 and um, premium and Nuvis introduced, premium was introduced in 2002 and Nuvis in 2007 respectively. And the Nuvis arrangement has a pension age of 65 and is actually a career average scheme and those arrangements don't have an automatic lump sum but again, you can commute some of your pension and get an automatic lump sum. The other main scheme is known as Alpha, and it was introduced as part of the Reform and Public Service Pension Schemes, which you may have heard a little bit about in 2015. And Alpha is a very different scheme. It's a career average scheme, which the majority of our members in are in, and there's about 23,000 in it. And the pension from this scheme is based on your salary over the whole of the member's career. There's no automatic lump sum in this scheme, but members again can commute part of their pension and take a lump, scheme, a lump sum in that. And scheme retirement age in that scheme is linked to state pension age, which as you may know, um, state pension age is ever increasing. In both schemes, the lump sum is tax free, but the pensions are taxable. In Alpha, the pension scheme grows faster as it has what's called a higher accrual rate than any other of the arrangements under the Principal Civil Service Pension Scheme. There are also differences in the benefits provided under each scheme, such as ill health, death and service and dependence benefits. The other associated schemes are the Compensation Scheme, which provides provisions for voluntary exit, redundancy and compulsory redundancy. There's also an Injury Benefit Scheme, which provides for temporary and permanent injury awards for staff injur injured at work and a review of this scheme is currently underway. There's also a partnership pension scheme, which is, defined, which is a defined contribution scheme. Just, just, just one second. Voluntary exit scheme, that's now complete, hasn't it? For the majority of the civil service ones? Yeah, yeah, it's, yes. it's, it's now yes. complete. Um, yeah. It's not yes. coming back, so it's... Yes, but there still are provisions for having a voluntary exit scheme in the future. So I'm talking about the provisions that we have. Right, but the, uh, current, the scheme that had run has scheme run its has course, run is finished. Yes. but it's still there just in case it gets reintroduced. Mm, yes, yes. I'm talking right. about the provisions okay. that we have. Yeah. Yes. Sorry, I was just I was thinking, well, yes. Yes. Okay. yes, yes, but the actual one that we ran is finished, yes. Yeah. Okay. Um, so we also have a partnership pension scheme, which is a defined um, contribution scheme, and there are two um, supplementary defined um, benefit partnership schemes. So I'll now turn to the finance and governance in the civil service um, schemes. Uh, the detail of how the schemes are funded has been set out in the paper. The contribution rates are also set out are also set following a valuation process, which takes place every four years. And the current rates were set in April 19, and are based on the results of the 2016 valuations and will be in place until March 2023. The next valuation will be undertaken this year and the results will then be implemented from April 2023. The scheme valuation is undertaken by the Government Actuaries Department, commonly known as GAD, 
and GAD analyses the scheme data using a number of accrual assumptions and doing, in my words, very hard sums, and looks at the demographics to ensure the sustainability of the scheme. The results from the valuation determine the employer scheme contribution costs and also help to inform the employee contributions. Employer contributions from the scheme are paid from the Northern Iron Block, and pension scheme benefits for unfunded schemes, such as the civil service scheme, however, are paid for from annually managed, annually managed expenditure, commonly known as AMIC. Employer contributions are tiered so that those who earn more pay a, employee contributions are tiered so that those who earn more pay a higher rate. And work was done last year, um, which you'll be familiar about from the previous session, to align these bands to pay bands to the civil service in the civil service with um, employee contribution thresholds to ensure that when a member moved up a pay scale within the same grade, they did not move into a higher pension contribution ban and thus lose out on their pay increase. And we now have a process in place to ensure that pay and pension contribution thresholds remain aligned. And this minor adjustment has been possible with a negligible fiscal impact on the scheme yield. The, government's, the governance of the civil service schemes includes bodies established under the Public Service Pensions Act and as part of pension reform since 2015, namely a scheme advisory board and also a pension board made up of employer and also employee representatives. The pensions board's responsibility is to assist the scheme manager to ensure compliance with the Northern Ireland civil service pension schemes and other legislation relating to the governance and administration of the scheme. This includes any other statutory scheme connected to it. The board must also assist with the scheme manager in complying with the pension regulator's codes of practice for public sector schemes. The regulator's principal aim is to prevent problems from developing by working with the civil service pension scheme manager and providing guidance on the pension board's responsibilities. The scheme advisory board has responsibility for providing advice on the desirability of changes to the scheme and on matters of policy. For example, they would deal specifically with the outcome of the scheme valuation process and make recommendations on any potential changes to scheme design of the Alpha scheme only, including the accrual rate and employee contributions. There are also two key important annual exercises undertaken by civil service pensions, and these both have legislative deadlines. Annual benefit statements um, must be issued to all members of the Alpha scheme, and pension saving statements are issued to higher earners. I'm just going to touch very briefly on these today because they're quite important matters. An annual benefit is a really critical document for members, and it helps them understand their pension. So if you're in a pension scheme, make sure you get an annual benefit statement. For most of our members, i.e. those in Alpha, it is actually, as I say, it's a statutory legal requirement that we issue members with one statement a year. And we actually aim to issue statements to all members, whether it's a statutory requirement or not. So for those in Classic, it's actually not a statutory requirement, but we actually achieve uh, statements to them. And we've also provided an online package and face-to-face -face sessions for a number of members to really help them understand and value their uh, annual benefit statements. Pension saving statements are also issued to members identified by our uh, records who may breach what's called an annual allowance threshold, and those thresholds are set not by us, um, but actually by uh, HMRC each year on the amounts that can actually be put into pension pots each year. And those thresholds are, have been decreasing over a number of years. And it's not just the very high earners who are sometimes caught by those thresholds and may face a tax charge by HMRC. Communication and engagement is a really important part of our role and one that we are devoting more resources to. Because as the ever-changing world of pensions, we've conducted a number of face-to-face -face pension awareness sessions with our, with our members. And those have proved really, really popular. We're also planning to develop more online e-learning packages so that members can go in at their, and at their own time and at a time that's convenient to them and look and try and understand, in particular, the annual benefit one has proved very popular. We have over 3,000 members who have engaged in that and can work through that 
and really get to grips and understand, in particular, their annual benefit statement, which, if you like, is like a, I would describe it as a gateway to understanding the world of pensions, and that's pretty very popular indeed, and we plan to, to develop more of them. That will be very popular when I come to speak a little bit about the, the McLeod issue and describe that to you. Mm -hmm. We also engage with our employers through a number of events as well, and we have a very good working relationship with our uh, civil service unions through a body called the Pensions Forum, which is part of the Whitley structure, if you are familiar with that, in the civil service as well. So I am going to turn now to the wider work we do, um, which includes public service policy and legislation. And this small branch deals um, with the wider public service schemes in Northern Ireland. That includes teachers, it includes health, it includes local government, it includes fire, it includes police, it includes the devolved judiciary, and of course the civil service as well. And just in the interest of clarity, it does not cover, sometimes it's important to know what we don't do as well as what we do do, it does not cover the armed forces scheme, nor the main judicial pension schemes, because those schemes are not devolved to Northern Ireland. So following the reforms of public service pensions and additional governments, governance and cost controls, in effect, um, this small branch actually replicates some of the functions that are carried out by Treasury. It replicates some of those functions in, in Northern Ireland, in that it, we produce directions which inform how scheme valuations are carried out here in, in Northern Ireland. It also leads, and I lead, on the consultations with all the public sector trade unions at a very useful forum um, called the Central Consultative Working Group under the auspices of NICIC. I chair that on behalf of the management side, and that includes all the public sector trade unions. It's a very valuable forum. It's been going for a, a long number of years now, and it's a very positive forum. It's not to say we don't disagree at times, but it's a very helpful forum because it includes all the public sector trade unions. So it's a very useful forum to have all the public sector trade unions together and indeed all of the management side in the one room. It's quite a big room at times um, to actually meet and engage on, on sometimes quite contentious issues. So in terms of, hopefully that's a helpful overview, I just want to turn now quickly, Chair, to the priorities that, that we're facing. And I'm going to deal with the priorities for the wider public sector first, because that will help inform, as the paper did, the, the priorities for civil service as well. The, the biggest issue um, that I want to focus on is McLeod. And I don't know how familiar you are with, with McLeod or not. Um, Very familiar. Mm -hmm. Well, that, that's helpful. So I, I wasn't sure of the level of yeah. knowledge. So I'll just explain it very briefly because I'm not sure how knowledgeable all members are. So if you're very familiar, I, I apologise. So I'll just give a very brief overview of it. And if you already know, then if you just are patient and, and bear with me. And if I say anything that you think is incorrect, I'm more than happy to be corrected. So um, the major issue, as I say, is, is McLeod. And I'm sure I'll be back before um, this committee again talking even more about McLeod. Um, I think it's the biggest issue facing pensions. I've been in pensions from 2008, and it's certain the, certainly the biggest issue in my experience dealing with pensions. Um, I suppose to explain why it's called McLeod, it's, it's called McLeod because that was the name of, of, of one of the need claimants. So just to, to explain that. Um, McLeod uh, is one of two priorities that I want to highlight. McLeod, I would describe as a, as a known unknown. Um, sounds rather oxymoronic as I describe it, um, but as I explain a little about it, I trust you'll agree with me that while we're aware of the issue and the problem, the solution or the remedy in terms of detail, I'm trying to preempt your questions now, in terms of the detail around the, the timescales and the remedy and exactly what we're going to do, are definitely somewhat elusive at, at this juncture. So you can ask me questions on that, but the answer will be some of these matters are still under consideration and some of these matters are still part of the, the legal process as the IT process rolls out in, in, in England in particular. So McLeod relates to a ruling by the Court of Appeal in 2018, and it goes back to when public service pensions were reformed in 2015. And at that time, those closer to scheme retirement age were allowed to remain in their original scheme, i.e. the one that they joined on entering in employment or opted to join in 2002. And those within 10, 10 and 13 years of retirement age were, were permitted to remain in their old scheme until they retire or for a longer period respectively, depending on their age, and the move to the new scheme was phased. Those further to retirement age automatically um, into, moved into their uh, new career average scheme from the 1st of April. And this 
transitional protection, um, as it became known, was viewed to be reasonable at the time of pension reform, as those closer to retirement had less time to adjust and prepare for change. Um, that was seen to be reasonable. Um, the Court of Appeal um, disagreed with that view and ruled that it was discriminatory and therefore unlawful. Um, this means that all um, public service pension schemes which adopted this approach, including those here in Northern Ireland, now need to remove the discrimination and go back to those impacted by it and since 2015. So not only do we do have to deal with those now, we have to remove the discrimination retrospectively to 2015. And this is not as simple as some people may think, uh, and indeed I wish it were, as just putting everybody back into their old scheme. To, so do you remember I talked about the civil service schemes and saying they were generally final salary scheme, classic, and the new scheme was called Alpha, the career average scheme. So it's not as simple if I can use the civil service analogy of saying we we'll just put everybody that's an Alpha back or 23,000 members back into the old classic scheme. Would that it was. It's not, as, it's not as simple as that. Because for some people, because Alpha has a better accrual rate, so their pension pots grow faster, some of them may actually be better off in their new scheme. So why would you put somebody back into an old scheme when they might actually be better off in their new scheme, even if they retired at 60? Mm -hmm. Even if by retiring earlier, um, you would lose a wee bit out because you'd be taken a bit off because you retired earlier, they may still be better off in their new scheme. I hope I've, I've explained yeah, but that. Not, not that many. You need to look at everybody's individual circumstances, and, that, and that's, that's actually the issue. Um, so it may not it may not be that many, but you can't just say you can't just say you know who do, who do you say would not be better off? So I've got the answer to that later on. You, well, I'd be very very interested in, in, in hearing your answer, member. That would be interesting. So the detail of the remedy um, is not clear, and also because of scheme design, you're not just looking at the pension and the lump sum, because there are other factors in the makeup of a scheme which are different. There are other benefits which go with the pension scheme which are different. Um, death and service may be different. The benefits of ill health may be different. The benefits for de dependents may be different. So if you like, you're looking at the analogy I, knew, I, I use, and you can forgive me, um, this sounds terribly feminist, is if you're buying a washing machine, you're looking at the, you're looking at the, the spin speed, um, you're looking at the noise factor. I don't like a noisy washing machine. You're looking at all the factors. So if you go into Curry's and you're looking at Go Compare, on a on selection of washing machines, you know how maybe uh, the ladies just do that and the men don't buy washing machines, and you're looking at how you compare washing machines, you're not just looking at the price, sorry gents if you don't buy washing machines, you're looking at a number of factors, so it's the same sort of thing, you're looking at a decision tree for, um, you sort of get this don't you, yeah, at, good. <laughs> at you but you know or, or if you're going to buy a car maybe that fits better, you're looking at a number of factors, and so it is with the pension scheme, there are a number of benefits with a pension scheme. It isn't just about the pension and the lump sum. There are, on a serious note, I was a bit flippant off, may I apologise. There are a number of benefits to a pension scheme, as there are with a car or a washing machine or anything that you, you are buying, because when you're purchasing a pension, if, if members understand that. So it's not just the pension and the lump sum. You need to look at the total package of what you're buy buying, and you need to compare that, not just the bottom line, I can use that analogy. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's, it's extremely complex, and that's why you know, the communication to members in this will be, will be vital. So uh, hopefully I have e explained that. Um, the other issue that, so it's, it's very likely that we're going to have to look at some Where does sort the of option lie? Is it with the individual pension holder or is it The option, it's very likely, Chair, that we're going to have to go through an option exercise with each member and present to them their, if you like, their options package and explain and communicate with them so that each member will have to make an option um, so that they will be presented with the package and they will be asked to, to decide. So that's, that's a likely outcome of this um, and that's very likely that that will be the remedy. But of course what we need to do is we need to have sufficient information so that nobody will feel as if they had insufficient information to make the decision from yes which is the problem you have at the moment because you don't know you don't have all the what's the benefits and benefits of the two schemes are likely to be in comparison 
Well, we know we know what the makeup is of each scheme, so yeah. we do know what the, the, the scheme designs are. We have we have that information, so we need to gather that potential. It depends on the individual circumstance of what the yes. implications yes. are. Yes, yes, and you're also it depends when that member is asked to, you know, make the decision as well. So there there are those factors to be to be considered, <coughs> and there are different proposals around the timing of that decision as well. There's different scenarios being considered around that. Um, so it will be quite a significant amount of work to make sure the member is fully and properly in, informed and is making what could be termed a meaningful decision as well, um, so that they're making they, they have got all the information to make a proper choice. Um, and of course, the other issue, of course, for sort of the wider aspect of it is, you know, the change to the pension scheme was designed to save money. Yes. And of course, there's every there's every chance that this is going to be significantly more expensive. Yes. Um, by a, and I noticed in one of your things in your noting brief, the effect that it is not possible to make accurate calculations of the cost cap, yeah. which fills me with a lot of concern. Yeah, and the cost cap and the last valuation, I was just going to come to that, Chair. Um, the cost cap was, um, the review of the cost cap, uh, uh, the government had already announced, um, because of the result of the last valuation, um, which was a surprising result. So the government had already decided... Talk to me about surprising. It was a surprising result because the result was that the um, employee... Um, the cost cap was a mechanism put in as a result of pension reform, which was about balancing the cost between the member and the taxpayer. As a result of the very first time the cost cap was used, the cost cap came out. The result of the valuations across the whole of the public sector in the UK... Um, favoured the member very significantly across all the scheme, i.e. favoured the employee. Um, so that was being looked at um, because it wasn't expected that that would come out so significantly to the, to the member. And also um, because of McLeod, it was felt that, you know, because then, the, if you like, the scheme design was then under review as well. And also the fact that um, the if you like, the, the, the makeup of the scheme and how it was based, because of the McLeod judgment as well, the fact that if we were going to have to do a decision, and because the results of the valuation that were going to be acted on would have been from April, were April 19, the McLeod judgment was December 18. Um, if we're going to apply, as, we, as, we, as the thinking was, the McLeod judgment from April 15, then the, the evidence that was used to inform those valuations was going back to April 16. The nature of the evidence base to inform those valuations, given that we were going to potentially have to undo them, was an incorrect, I'm sorry, I'm going back in time, was yeah. an incorrect basis to inform those valuations. So the cost cap mechanism was an incorrect mechanism to use in the first place. If we were going to have to go back and unravel all that, you can see how it's like unraveling a ball of wool. Um, so it was felt then, for all sorts, all those myriad reasons, that the cost cap was was, a, was an ineffective mechanism, and had given a, you know a perverse result because we were going to have to go back and back in time. So for those reasons, the cost cap was paused, and the outcome of those valuations was was paused because we were potentially going to have to undo that. Um, government did appeal to the Supreme Court. Um, or sorry, sought leave to appeal to the Supreme Court, but was refused leave to appeal um, in June 2019. Um, so for that reason, the cost cap has been paused and the outcome of those valuations, for all those reasons, and the outcome of the valuations have been paused at this point in time. Um, and those matters are still under consideration. Mm. Deep joy. So uh, hopefully that, that explains that a little bit. Um, yep. So it is, it is, it is quite... It is quite um, Go on, make my day. Talk about Crapita. Sorry, Capita. <laughs> well, just have a few other bits I wanted yep. to cover as well. Um, so there is uncertainty around that, and um, my department in, uh, introduced um, directions here to... Um, we introduced directions to actually pause the, the cost cap as well. Um, the remedy solution is very likely to require primary legislation, so I've no doubt I'll be back before this committee as well to, um, to deal with the primary legislation. I just wanted to touch very briefly on one other complex issue, um, slightly more complex if that can be possible than the, the world of MacLeod, and that's guaranteed minimum pension known as um, GMP. Mm -hmm. um, and put very simply, um, 
the um, members of the uh, in terms of the public service pension schemes they Thank contracted you. out of the state pension and this meant that members paid less in national insurance contribution um, but also would get a reduced state pension and this was what was known as a guaranteed uh, but a guaranteed minimum pension was introduced from their occupational pension scheme if you like this was kind of a safety blanket and some of the annual pension increase in respect of GMP was provided by the occupational pension scheme <coughs> and some by the state pension. And it sounds like a very sensible concept and it's always proved very difficult over the years to administer, but particularly so from the recent changes, which members may be aware of in state pension in April 16, when the um, schemes could no longer contract out of the state pension. <laughs> But just to say briefly, there have been significant issues around these payments will be indexed going forward and how it will be administered. So no doubt I'll be back before this committee again on that. I just want to touch very briefly, and I will come to Capita shortly, <coughs> on the priorities for the civil service scheme. McLeod and indeed business as usual are our greatest challenges. Some of them have touched on the need to produce annual benefit statements, the annual allowance statements for our members, to continue to pay our pensioners. <coughs> In total, we make payments of around 350 million a year. Um, McLeod will be a significant pressure for actually for us in the civil service to administer to improve our communications. We have already begun to, you know, scenario plan within the civil service scheme for McLeod. Um, and just to delve down a little bit to give you a little flavour of what McLeod could mean for civil service, which is one of the, not quite the smallest scheme, but isn't the largest scheme in Northern Ireland. Health is the largest scheme. But just to give you a little taste of what McLeod means, because I think it's important that members grasp this. The numbers for McLeod, um, as I say, we have our, you know, 30,000 active members to deal with. We have about 10,000 members that have left since 2015. And I just want to drill down to the 10,000 that have left. Um, typically, we have around, and it's quite a serious note, we have around 60 or so deaths in service a year. Some in very tragic and un unfortunate circumstances, and some in very sudden circumstances. So, in the worst case scenario, if this takes seven years to resolve before it goes through the legal process, and we know exactly what we're, what we're doing, potentially we may have to revisit 420 families or so to have to deal with this. So you can imagine how difficult that will be to go back to family members who won't know anything about pensions and say, you know, your family member may have made the wrong choice as to whether they should have been an alpha or classic or whatever. And they're already dealing with grief. They're maybe dealing with grief that's happened, you know, very recently or the death of a family member who happened in 2015. And that will be very difficult for them to do. So you can get a sense, I think, of how complex this will be. It will require very sensitive handling. I've already spoken to our welfare colleagues. We have a welfare service in, in the Northern Ireland Civil Service who have agreed you know, that they will cooperate with us and, and you know, they will assist with us. And you know, they're very skilled in, in dealing with people in these tragic circumstances. But, um, I just wanted to, I think it's important to alert you that, you know, this is not only complex, but it's also very difficult when you actually think of the personal circumstances that, that people are dealing with. And I think it's important that you're aware of that and you're aware that we are sensitive to that. You know, we're, it sounds pretty dire to raise, but, you know, we have a bereavement team and pensions as well. So we, we know we're sensitive to that. And I just wanted to assure members that, you know, we will deal with those things sensitively and, and as best we can, because I think it's important that we show compassion. And I just wanted to assure members that we will indeed do that. In terms of the replacement of the IT system, the, implement the implementation of the current IT system is on track for completion by 2020. And at this point, we have 25 products remaining to be completed. In total, we have over 88% of the project delivered. There haven't been, been significant delays. We do need to decide whether to avail of the extension of the provision that's included in the current contract or to go um, for fresh procurement. I can't elaborate any more on the options about whether we uh, go for the extension or fresh, or, or fresh procurement due to commercial restrictions, which I trust members will appreciate. Um, there have indeed been problems with implementing the um, current system, uh, not least because when it went live, we were introduced in 2015, we were introducing the new alpha system. 
and we did not approve a new Alpha scheme, which we didn't realise how complex that would be. And also, as the chair has already alluded, it was um, decided late in 2014, which was totally unforeseen, that we also needed to run a whole series, not just for the civil service, but also for a number of our other employers and a number of arm's length bodies, a number of voluntary exit schemes, which was totally unplanned for and unforeseen. So we had the perfect storm. We were introducing a new IT system and we were introducing a new alpha scheme, which we didn't quite expect, which was very complicated. And somebody somewhere decided, and by the way, Grace, run a number of voluntary exit schemes. So that contributed to a significant delay in introducing our new IT system as well. So thank you, and uh, I'm happy to take questions from members. Thanks, Jim. Um, I always thought that Jonathan I knew had the best job in the world. He's the BBC cricket commentator touring... Sun Kit's speech is covering cricket, but I think you've got the best job in the world because yeah. you do. I think what you're doing is so relevant and absolutely fascinating. <laughs> why, do you, why do you believe that in eight minutes? Time's a rather different issue. I do, um, love, I do love pensions. It mightn't sound like that. I, I actually I do. I think a yeah, lot of them or hate them. And I, oh, I, love, I love them. them. Could I, first of all, say that I'm a, a member of the Assembly's Pension Trustees and have been since the Boer War. So therefore, <laughs> I... I can't, nobody can remember a time where I wasn't a pension trustee, and obviously we're grappling with McLeod. I did study the Boer War, so it's very fascinating. <laughs> so, well, some people believe I fought in it. Um, but uh, so that makes me very interested in pensions. But what, what I would say to you is that you know, the pension trustees are, are grappling with McLeod as well, so that's why this is extremely relevant. A uh, couple of questions. Will any this just to set the scene, will any additional expenditure that you incur or the, the block grant incurs, will that come directly as a social welfare payments directly from London, or will it have any impact on the block grant? Uh, that, that, that will cloud every judgment of this. In other words, it's free money. Okay. Um, the expenditure, I think, falls into two categories. One, there, there's the expenditure to actually administer the remedy okay so that that expenditure will come from the block grant so if I take it to the if I keep it with the civil service scheme so or indeed the other schemes to administer that will be a hit on the block grant the expenditure for the the remedy for the scheme the thinking so what um, members actually get um, my understanding is that will come from Amy, Amy. Right. Amy. so that, that that's um, crucial yeah. And we know that because obviously if it's a horrendous figure, at least if it's coming from Amy, yeah. it's coming from the central pool run coming out of our health or our roads or our farmers. Sure. We, we don't really know the quantum yet at all until they decide what remedy is. Yeah. 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 You know, um, pensioners in payment are paid from Amy. The employer costs would come out of the departmental yeah. accounts. But I've looked at one small pension <laughs> scheme that's horrendous. The yeah. impact of McLeod, absolutely yeah. horrendous. I mean, it is fair to say that when the employer costs, the, the employer contributions were set in 2019, <coughs> they were set with a view to um, taking account of McLeod. Right, but what about the previous years? Where we didn't take account of McLeod? But they were they were kind of set with a view that that would cover because there was quite a significant increase in employer costs across all okay. public service pension schemes to cover that. But again, and this is where I, and I apologise to the committee because it is my answer is vague, which isn't helpful. Until we know exactly what the remedy is, it is it is difficult to say. Um, but th that's you know, so part of the, part of the costs definitely were thought of, and that's as strong as I can say, um, by the employer costs that were set in 2019. And certainly part of the thinking is that the, that the costs of actually um, providing the remedy um, will be Amy costs. Right. Now, you say it's going to require primary legislation to deal with this. It's likely to require... Right. Will that be done by means of a UK-wide bill where we have legislative consent or require a bill going through the Northern Ireland Assembly? I think it's, I think it's very likely it will require a bill going through... I think we will require uh, a bill going through our Assembly to, re, to amend our public service... Because we, have a, we had our own Public Service Pensions Act here in um, 2014 to introduce the reform of public service pensions in Northern Ireland. So I think it's very likely we will require primary legislation okay. potentially to make an amendment. That potentially, it does depend exactly on what the terms of the remedy are. Right. Now, if that goes, you're responsible for <coughs> Department of Health pensions, Department of Education, etc. Basically, anything in Spencer Road, Waterside House, basically? 
Um, we're Bay Street. Waterside yeah. House. Yeah. So I think it goes through Waterside House. Nilgus, which is the other yes. multi-billion pound pension scheme we have in Northern Ireland. Yes. Will the legislation cover that type of pension scheme? Yes. It will. So will it cover all pe state pension schemes of, of state agencies? It doesn't cover... No, I'm not responsible for state pension schemes. I'm no, but I'm talking about uh, public civil public service, service and public, public service, service pension yes. schemes. Yes, yes. So, so anybody, like Housing Executive, Tourist Board or whatever, it's going to cover all of those, the legislation? It will cover those. It will cover all other bodies if they are... Um, members, members yeah. of a public service pension scheme. Made under the Public Service Pensions yeah. Act. The Public Service Pensions Act lists the other bodies that are included in it. But equally, public bodies who are not clearly, if you go down that route, they're going to have to, because we case the go straight to judicial review, they didn't. The, the, the tourist board, for example, or whatever you're talking about, would be under our Schedule 1, which falls under the Superannuation Act 1972, so they sit within the Civil Service Pension Scheme yeah. and would be covered under the main primary legislation. Because as soon as this is broadcast, people are going to start ringing MLAs and saying, am I covered by MacLeod? Yes. Am I going to be covered by the MacLeod judgment? Yeah. Yeah. And you're saying it's very, very wide. Yes. Yeah. And are, will there be any state employees at any level who will not be covered by the legislation? It only applies if there is age discrimination in the scheme. The mm -hmm. Public, public Service Pensions Act actually put in the age-related discrimination. Um, so that old schemes are made under that. But most pension schemes followed the civil service lead on this and have gone for uh, protective measures, but only for those within 10 years. Can I just say it's not, it's not the civil service lead. It's the Public Service Pensions Act yes. lead. Yes, yeah. I understand that, yes. Yeah. But most pension schemes have followed the lead yeah. given by the public sector. Yeah. Yeah. So if the legislation is passed, it has a ramification yeah. for just about every public body yeah. in Northern yeah. Ireland. Well, local government, in fact, have a completely different system. Local government have a, an underpin, didn't have transitional protections. So they have, they have a different issue and are having a different approach to deal with. Okay. So it's, it's, slightly, it's, it's slightly different in, in each scheme. But the cloud provision is still there. The sort of the, the different the difficulties for them as well, isn't it? Still yet to be transitioned. Yes. yes. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. The remedy is different. Yeah, the remedy is different. The remedy but will be different. So it's it's not it's not exactly the same for each scheme. There there are different nuances within each scheme, but there's the, but there still is an issue. And, from, and for my own information, I should know this, but I apologise. The Alpha scheme for the, within the Northern Ireland public sector, for the sake of better terms, how different is that from uh, England and Wales? It's, if we just keep it at a high level, it's generally the same. Yes. Yeah. It, but it's, it's generally the same. But uh, what I'm thinking yes. of, if, if it's a UK-wide issue yes. with McLeod and it comes through, there could yeah. be a UK-wide remedy, which reduces potentially, yes. potentially yes. I use the word, the implications in Northern Ireland because obviously there will be yes. changes in the Barnett, Barnett uh, formula yes. and the rest of it yes. to deal with that. And we, we are but we have a separate Pensions Act. Yes, yes. And, right. and we, are, we are working closely with colleagues in the Treasury and closely with colleagues in um, other schemes um, in Britain to see what the developments are there, so that <coughs> they are well informed of what their thinking is, what the thinking is as the various um, tribunals, you know, work through the legal process over there. So, so we're not an <coughs> issue of the committee. We're not, you know, we're not doing this on, in isolation in Northern Ireland. You know, we're working yeah. closely with them because obviously, if they come up with a, a solution that will be helpful to us. Um, to, to implement here as well. So, uh, you know, that's important that we do that and, and sensible and pragmatic. Mm. That, that that's probably the wrong well. question to ask you, but the buyback, which is eventually what the solution will have to be, which will get us back to where we should have been so that everybody's <coughs> on the same virtual classic pension scheme process, it's going to make sure that you know, any of the savings that they thought they were introducing have gone completely, won't they? Um, possibly. I don't know. Yeah. I don't know. I don't know. I just, just, just two more quick, because you, by the way you've answered the questions, you've eliminated an awful lot of questions I had, which is good news, because I was going to go through a whole list. <laughs> the, way, the way that you've phrased it's very, very helpful. <clears throat> uh, it's going to apply to those who have retired, who have been caught in the interim. 
Yes. And it's going to apply to those who are the, the, the widows and orphans of the deceased yes. and the widowers and orphans. Yes. So again, that's very helpful. Yes. Then, could I just move on to another issue, which, which is related. Um, if you're aware of the British Steel issue in South Wales and the huge scam there was there in terms of defined benefit pension schemes. And people investing, is this what you're talking B about? People being approached scam. by financial advisors. Yes. Yes. Now, um, clearly people coming out with the civil service are a government, any government agency so could be approached or will be approached by advisors and I'm dealing with one at the minute where it looks a, a fantastic deal, <coughs> over £100,000 when you analyse it. What steps are your staff taking to prevent civil servants and other government mm -hmm. health workers, etc., uh, government <coughs> employees being caught up in that situation, which uh, they reckon that 72% of the advice given to those people has been wrong because it's generating commission? Yeah. We don't have that, have that many people, um, to the best of my knowledge, who actually you know, would lift their pension and transfer it out. We work very closely um, with, I can speak pensions more from, with the pensions regulator and certainly I can speak more for the civil service than I can for, for other schemes, um, but we work very closely with the civil service trade unions to, if we find out about any particular scam, you know, to, to publicise it um, and to you know, share that information and we have very few to the best of my knowledge who actually lift their pension and transfer it out. To, an, to another body. It actually came up at a, at a meeting I was at yesterday in, in Treasury where, you know, if, an, if a member is adamant that they want to do it, we actually can't stop them doing it, unfortunately, believe it or not. So we have limited yeah. the types of where people can actually transfer their benefits to. Mm -hmm. So there's certain types of defined contribution schemes where we cannot transfer the member's benefits to, regardless of whether they want mm -hmm. or don't. Mm -hmm. We also include when someone requests a transfer or just a, a value of what their benefits would be like if they wanted to transfer. We provide a lot of literature <coughs> to, to the member about scams at the time when they request their cash equivalent transfer value. And our website has information yeah. on you, the If you transfer to a fair private pension scheme, that's one stage to then transferring it out completely so and buying a Ferrari. Else, yeah. Right. Now, the, the problem is the British Steel indicated for the vast majority of the pensioners that was the wrong decision. And the reason it was made is the person trying to convince them to do it was attracting a large commission. Uh, mm -hmm. and, and there's tens of thousands of people who have been scammed in this way. Now, I'm relieved to hear there's only relatively small mm -hmm. numbers as far as your members are concerned. Mm -hmm. But you don't actively try to, to write to these people and say to them, look, do you really want to do this? The literature says all that. It covers yeah. the scams. The literature is literature provided on the Pensions Regular website. We include that literature with our information when it's sent out, and that's before they put anything in writing to yes. to sign off that they want to they sign up for the transfer. We would provide it, them information. Would it be helpful if we, um, if, if the chair agrees, would it be helpful <coughs> if we shared with you what we have? Well, it, well, it would, be, would be, but yeah. don't rely upon the fact that the person's had independent financial advice because that independent financial advice <coughs> is not independent at all if it's attracting but a large commission. But it's information that we are giving. We are giving directly to the member. I'm just thinking, would it be helpful if we, would, would the be. chair agrees, if we if we shared that with members of the yeah, committee? Yeah, it would be. Yeah, and we work very right. closely with the pension regulators, so any updates that they would have, we ensure we put those on our website for our members to read, etc. Um, and as we say, the literature that goes out to should cover that. <coughs> well. well, if the chair agrees, um, you know we're happy to um, you know share those links. With members of the committee, if that's acceptable, mm -hmm. yeah. that, yep. that it's that agreeable yeah. to members. Yeah. Thanks, sir. Chairman. Thank you very much for that. I find that really interesting, actually. Um, Pensions is great. I don't think it's. No, we'll probably think it was going to be more. Than saying it wasn't. No. Um, <coughs> this could be a stupid question, but um, never a stupid question. Why? Well, why? Who came, or what happened? Why was the decision to go from classic to alpha? Why was? Why was classic? Why was alpha introduced, basically? To save money. Mm. <laughs> Which it hasn't. That was the shortest answer you ever gave this committee. Yeah. Which it hasn't. <laughs> to, to make it clear, it was to make them fair and sustainable for the future. Fair and transparent and sustainable for the future. That's the line that was. That's the official line. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Save the taxpayer. Okay. Save. Okay. And the other question. My answer was right as well. <laughs> <laughs> um, the other question. 
Did you say, this is a clarification, did you say there could be 10,000 people affected by this, McLeod, or was that just... There could, there could be, there could be, the scheme there could be, be for the civil service, anymore. there could be 40,000 people affected by Clint McLeod. Okay. There are 10,000 people, roughly, who will have left from 2015, by the time we know what we're doing. Okay. And there are 30,000 active members who are still employed, yeah, that, if you like. Yeah. So in total, for, and it's just for the civil service. And those 10,000 are likely to increase by the time we actually come to the remedy and start work. And you have no idea when that will be like that remedy, no? It could be another, it could be another year or so. Is, is, like, so is there basically people working in the background <coughs> trying to figure out? Yeah. Oh, God. Okay. Thank you. And oh, the other question is, the, on a totally different topic, the injury benefit scheme. You said yeah. it's under review. What? Yeah. It's, like, where is it at or why is it under review? Um, it's on a review because it's been the same for a very long time. So there, are, I suppose, there's two angles to the review. One is there's a number of um, what I would describe as technical changes needed to to bring it up to date. Oh. So, for example, there's been changes in um, the names of state benefits. We need to ah, okay. need to bring that up to date. We need to bring it up to date to include the names of other schemes, like Alpha isn't, isn't included in it. And there's other things we really need to look at it because the costs of the injury benefit scheme have really gone very high. So we need to look at actually making it more sustainable as well because there's a really high cost to employers and it's, there's a number of things we need to look at in that as well. Oh, okay. Okay. The employer meets the cost for the injury scheme so we bill the employers for that outside of the employers. <coughs> oh, all right, okay. Yeah. But there's different kinds of illnesses now that we haven't taken into account when the initially the injury benefit scheme sort of developed for somebody that might have fallen and broken their leg or broken yeah. their arm but I mean there's much more um, yeah. mental health issues and all that people yeah. suffer from now so we have to just... So it doesn't really take account of... Um, I mean, the, the prevalent um, illnesses that we have now are um, much more to do with mental health issues than physical health issues. So okay. we need to just re um, bring it up to date to reflect that as well. Thank you. All right. Great. Thank, Thank you. you. Sure. Well, thank you. Um, it, does anyone lose out in this or everybody? Is it a cost that will be benefit to everybody? On the cloud? Uh, um, the, the principle is that there will be no detriment. Mm. So the principle is that nobody will lose out. Nobody will. You see, in terms of the family members who have passed away, did, are they that passed away whilst in employment or after they left employment? Both. Both. And, and the then it that follows. Was quoted as the deaths and services, okay. but then we will have also. Other so it follows through. These are the deaths and services. So it's, it's, the idea is it includes. Everybody. Yeah. Figure, figure I was talking about um, the 400 odd is, are the deaths and services. Yeah. yeah. So it's really any movement from 2015. Yeah. I was just giving you that. The remedy yeah. will have to be reviewed. Yeah. 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 So you'd have also people who would have been, you know, medically retired or, you know, all, all sorts of reasons. I was just, I was just yeah. drilling down okay. to give you one, one example of a group of people of deaths and service, you know, because I think those will be, I'm not saying the death of a pensioner isn't traumatic, but I think the deaths and service. Are, are not always, um, you know, um, unforeseen, if I can use that word, um, but are, are quite often in very traumatic yeah, circumstances, yeah. you know. Yeah. Okay, okay. Jim, thank you. Thanks, Sean. Jim. Just one question. Are local government pensions AME funded? No, so the local government scheme no. is a funded pension scheme. Mm. That's the, sorry, I should have made that clear. It's the only, well, it's not the only, it's the main funded pension scheme in Northern Ireland um, and it's a very successfully funded pension scheme. It's very, it's very sustainable. So there will be different issues. Sorry, I should have made that clear. It's a very helpful question. <coughs> it's, it's different from the other schemes as well. It's not will it suffer either. a McLeod impact? It will have a McLeod impact and how, how that actually works out will be a different scenario and as well. If that creates an extra cost, on whom does that fall? I'm tempted to say good question. Um, it's likely to fall on the scheme, but I actually don't know the answer to that. I mean, the rate right. pair. It potentially could, but I actually don't know because that's still under that's still under consideration. The the kind of the parameters around local government at this point in time have almost been set aside because the focus has been on the main public service pension schemes, which are the main unfunded schemes. So local government pension schemes um, across the UK are still being looked at. Get some clarity. But I can follow up and try and get some more information on that, if that would be yeah. helpful. Thank you. Okay. Pat. <coughs> Thanks, Chair. 
you did. You said there that there would be primary and secondary legislation brought yes. forward. So you, you must have a time on that. And I'm querying: uh, Did no one see that prior to the uh, McLeod case? You know, was it not brought forward previously? Has nobody seen it? Did you not think that, that you know someone not been able to tell us what this impact was going to be? And did you have any knowledge of that? And are there any copies, or are there any, is there any thing brought forward to use prior to 2015, or even <coughs> subsequently from 2015? Do you mean did we not see the McLeod case coming? Mm -hmm. well, well, I'm not saying that that's it, but I mean, surely there must have been an impact. There ha had to be an impact on that. Surely somebody must have seen no. the, the changes to that. And what, what I'm coming back is, like, on the equality of all of that, on the, that, that was passed out to the members. Uh, was there an impact or was there a quality impact or anything yeah. set out on that? Yeah, there, there was, and it was felt that, um, and I have to hold my hands up here because I introduced the pension reform in Northern Ireland, and the view was, um, some of us may still share that view, that by introducing the transitional protections, that that was a reasonable approach to have protections for those um, who were closest to retirement age because changing people's pension arrangements is is generally viewed as being a life-changing decision. So to have protections for those who are closest to, to retirement age was seen to be a reasonable thing to do. Um, I mean, it was recognised that it was direct age discrimination, um, but it was seen as um, a proportionate thing to do in terms of having protections for those who were closest to retirement, um, and that was acceptable to do. Um, whereas those who were younger, um, then it was seen as reasonable that to move them more directly in because they had more time to plan and to adjust to the change because they were going to be at least 13 years away um, in most schemes, 10, 13 years away from retirement. So they could make other arrangements to deal with that change. So that was the view generally that was taken and uh, you know, advice would have been obtained on that and a quality impact uh, screening was done, and that was that was seen to be acceptable um, at the time. Pardon? UK-wide. Yeah, at UK-wide, that was the approach that was that was adopted and was viewed to be um, reasonable at the time. Um, so that was the accepted, I don't want to use the word wisdom, but that was the accepted thinking at the time, that that approach was reasonable, um, and that was the approach that was, that was adopted. Well, thank you. I hope you'll agree with me that once in the private sector, I mean, that would be, uh, would be just catastrophic I mean, for that. How does that affect? I mean, what way does that wash as against the private, as against the public sector? I know some private sector schemes, uh, some people I have dealt with in the private sector, some private sector schemes just seem to move people instantly. Mm -hmm. And if you follow the protection, without any protection and... Um, if you actually follow the thinking of this judgment, it would imply that people to be treated equally would just all be moved at the same time without any protection. But sure, just to laugh, but there is. I mean, I'm not saying that's right or yeah, wrong. Yeah, but there is a cost thing in this, and it's fallen into the public purse here again. No, but I'm just saying if you follow the rationale of the judgment, there wouldn't be any protection for any worker. So everybody who used the civil service terms would just instantly be moved from classic into alpha. Mm -hmm. And I'm not sure how popular that would have been with members either where you would have no, no phasing. Um, and indeed, that's what actually happens in some private sector schemes that I'm aware of, option. where there's actually no protection for the, for the workers at all, whereas this was seen to be, to actually phase it in for some members was, was seen at the time to have been a reasonable approach. And indeed, the, the trade unions here actually, um, though they didn't necessarily agree with reform per se, certainly um, didn't necessarily object to the phasing in. Mm. So they're, they're, you know, they're, I'm just going back in, in time and giving you the views of different stakeholders at the time. But, but, but the Court of Appeal disagreed with me, and who am I to disagree with the Court of Appeal? Sure, can you help me just, or, I mean, is there a cost in, in this? What is the cost and what are we talking about? I mean, a, a figure, I hear different schemes, pardon? The bill. Is it a billion? 
The figure that has been estimated, the initial figure that has been estimated for Northern Ireland um, for, by the Government Actuaries Department is a billion. That's very much um, an estimate and is likely to come down. But again, until we know the cost of the actual remedy, um, I can't give you more precise figures. Well, it won't go up. Yeah, it's a scheme mm. liability as well. It's uh, not like an upfront. The employer costs are going up by a billion it's Amy. pounds. It's, it's Amy. It's not blood grant. No. It's crucial. Yeah. <laughs> Just can I have one last thing? Yes, if there is money. Yes, still, that's right. Yeah, yeah. It's, I know it's, it's still that our money, well. but it's not money from the blood grant. It's London money, and that makes it. Uh, and I want that in tablets <laughs> no, of stone, by the money, way. Jim. <laughs> I want that yeah. in tablets of stone. Right. That's <laughs> Amy. I think it's that straightforward. You know, um, it doesn't come from the magic money tree. <laughs> But I think I think that the point is important. That, you know, it is still. I'm, I'm not making light at all that this is still this is still a cost, and I think this will have to be dealt with because it is important. Um, as I said, I'm passionate about pensions. It is important that public service pensions are sustainable. So you know that that is, that is important, and I've no doubt that will have to be looked at as well. You were asking earlier how do you solve the problem with all the pensioners? Simply send each of them a letter explaining their options. The benefits of, of reverting back, as it were, to the protected scheme are not, and leave it with them to make that decision. Is that not the way, way round it as far as the administration of this, which I accept is a very complex issue? Yeah, that's, that's more or less it. That, that, that is have to get the information to be able to provide that to the member. Yeah, okay. you can't that give. That is the intention. You can't the give. Members. One of the things that's happened, particularly in the Ministry of Defence scheme, was the issue you can't give false information. You need to have sufficient information that's yes. detailed enough to be able to yeah. make that question. Yeah. Yeah. And there's also a question of people who have gone from one scheme to another and have been taxed by HMRC yeah. on sort of lump <coughs> sums. So how is that refunded and all the rest of it? There is, there is multiple know. levels of complexity, which brings me to a question. Yeah, I uh, just say the tax issue, I didn't even touch on this, but the, the tax... Tax is a really important issue, and we had a, a, we've had a number of presentations in my meetings with Treasury on tax, and I have to confess, I didn't understand it. But if <laughs> so you don't understand it, that worries it, me. It is that really, worries me. The tax issues are really, really complicated when you're yes. trying to... I mean, in the world of pensions, to try and do something ret retrospectively is just anathema to me. <coughs> really, really complex to do. When you learn on top of that... The tax implications, yeah. it is just horrendous. So I'm not making light of that at all. So that, that is, that's a very, very difficult place to be. So, so thank you for, for bringing up no, that but it's Just it's for explanation, it, it, it might seem well, the simplest thing is just to move people from where they are back it's to not, where they were. Yeah. But particularly onto the tax implications, yeah. people yeah. really need to understand yeah. what yeah. the implications are. The fair comms have to be really robust whenever we do go out yeah. and, and, and taking the members' point there. Um, they have to understand before they actually make, make their option yeah. and so it's extremely important that we cover all the areas both yeah. in their old scheme and their new scheme and the implications of any decision that they make which well, brings me uh, <laughs> which tax. which brings me to the sort of the final question right. um are you appropriately resourced to do all this we are considering the resources required that would be a no then. <laughs> the politicians answer if there is one. You don't have to give, but we're the politicians. You just have to. Are you, are you appropriately resourced to do this? Because this is very complex when you're dealing with actuarial rules, when you're dealing with HMRC, you're dealing with an IT system that um, I noticed you were being very diplomatic about, but most people wouldn't necessarily be that diplomatic about the IT system and how it's being able to develop. You've got a dashboard system that needs to be fully populated. You need to have people who are suitably swept, who understand a very, very complex piece yeah. of sort of financial management and sort of pensions legislation. Mm. And you know, if we get this wrong, mm. we're opening ourselves up to another yeah. series of a sort of legal precedents that yeah. could, comp which would have not just Northern Ireland implications, would have implications across the, of the rest <coughs> of our nation. Yeah. So, again, resources. I have no doubt that our workload is significantly increasing, and to cope with that, to continue with our business as usual, we will need additional resources. Okay, thank well, you. Where will that bill fall? Who will pay that? DFP? Or is it coming out of Employers. Employers. The way we are funded is that um, we, uh, our administrative resource is 
um, charged out to our employer members. So we have a centralisation charge where we charge out per capita to our employers. So it doesn't, the fall do, does not, our charges, our administrative charges do not solely come from the Department of Finance. They're charged out to our employer members. But so at the end not, of the day, the employer members will be asking us for more if you increase your, your, your tariff. Pardon? The, the employer, the, the health, education, etc., will be looking for more money to pay for that if you increase your tariff. For Are, not, necess, not, not, not health. Um, the employer members who are members of the civil service pension scheme will be asking us. Will be there we go. Their, their charges will be increasing. So the department, the, the department of health, the civil service working in the civil servants working in the department of health, their charges will go up. The department of health's charges will go up, but not. Um, the Department of Health's pension scheme, if that makes sense. Grace, Margaret, Blennett, Collette, thank you very much indeed for coming in and thank you thank very you much indeed for coming to the committee. Thank, thank you for all those action points. <coughs> thank uh, you very committee, much. shall we take a, an ease for approximately three to four minutes? So we just uh, sort of pick things. Is the Northern Ireland Assembly committee room? Uh, it was a very useful session on pensions. But before we ever came into this room, we had a very effective informative seven-page brief. I don't think we then needed a half-hour opening statement. We're really going over the same ground. Mm -hmm. I think we should direct departmental witnesses that their opening statements should be short, concise, and be limited to five minutes, generally. But to waste half an hour really having the same stuff that was in the brief didn't seem to me to be efficient for the work of the committee. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Jim. I'll take that, and I'll take that as a chair. Um, I must admit, I found that useful because yeah. I was actually reading because of the complexities of the issues. Mm. That's why I lied at this time because, for me, and I understand some of the issues. It was useful for me to hear her, her go through it, and it enabled me to sort of formulate some of the questions I had. But I've noted your uh, comments, and uh, in future, when we have briefs like that, I'll judge the. The, I'll judge the discussion that's ongoing at the time. But thank you very much indeed. Uh, can we move on to the next order of business, please? And actually, Jim, it's a um, we're moving to private members' legislation, the function of government miscellaneous provisions bill. I'd like to draw members' attention to the Parks paper and the function of government miscellaneous provisions bill at page 43, and the letter from uh, Jim uh, in relation to the private members' bill on page 46. And the bill and the explanatory and financial memorandum on pages 47 to 55. Um, any comments from the members? Uh, can I seek agreement from members who are content to note in advance of the oral evidence on the 26th of February? All agreed? Say aye. A bit short opening statement. <laughs> <laughs> we we'll move on to item 7. The Spring Supplementary Estimate and Budget Bill, Northern Ireland. I want to draw members' attention to the Spring Supplementary Estimated Documents tabled in advance of the meeting, which arrived just before the meeting. And in advance of the meeting on the 19th of February, when officials will attend for oral evidence on the bill and the Spring Supplementary Estimates and the vote on account. Um, committee, I'd like to advise the members on the Assembly's vote on the account assuming it is passed, will allocate a sum equivalent to around about 45% of the 2019-20 final budget to departments and arms length bodies for expenditure in year 2020-21. will then come to be given legal authority via the Assembly's enactment of the forthcoming Budget Bill, Northern Ireland 2020, the Budget Bill. In effect, the Budget Bill will authorise more than £8 billion of expenditure across the departments. That expenditure amount has been informed by the information on resource requirements and pressures identified by individual departments to the Department of Finance in advance of the vote on account. The Department considers this all to be routine under the supply procedure. However, it is important to highlight that the current application of the supply procedure is not in routine circumstances. Rather, it is in the unusual circumstances in that it follows on from a three-year hiatus of Northern Ireland's fully functioning devolved institutions. And during that period from January 2017 to 20, Westminster addressed Northern Ireland budget considerations in the absence of the Assembly. The normal budget process has not been followed, 
given various political factors. As a result, this is the first opportunity for Assembly committees to meaningfully engage with the departments on their budgets, i.e. both for 2019-20 and the 2021 budgets, following the three-year gap. The Assembly v8 committees need to be briefed on the rationales underpinning departmental budget decision-making during that period to ensure robust scrutiny. It is essential that the Committee for Finance is appropriately consulted in all departmental spending priorities and resource requirements in order to be in a position to decide whether or not to grant accelerated passage to the Budget Bill as provided for in Standing Order 42.2 on the basis that the Committee is satisfied that there has been appropriate consultation with it on the public expenditure proposals contained in the Bill. Whilst recognising these are unusual circumstances, limiting what the committee can actually do on this occasion. But going forward, it is important, given the scale of the expenditure authorised through the budget bills, that statutory committees have the relevant information to robustly scrutinise department budgets, enabling committees to hold departments to account for their spending of public finances. This committee does not want to return to past budget practices undertaken in previous mandates, which were not optimum for budget scrutiny. The information provided to the Department of Finance by other departments in advance of the vote on account should have been provided to statutory committees and to the Finance Committee in advance of the forthcoming Budget Bill, and growing, going forward should be provided well in advance of the main estimates and the future Budget No. 2 Bill in order to inform committee, to inform committee scrutiny and consultation on the budget process. Members of the committee, are you content for us to convey these sentiment, sentiments to the department in advance of next week's oral evidence on the budget bill? Great. Agreed. Okay. Content. Um, sorry, Chair, you, you also wanted, uh, you had mentioned in advance of the meeting, uh, that oh, yes, sorry. you were asking the department uh, for information on when this year's uh, in your monitoring, public expenditure guidelines will be available. Yeah. And will the process of departments making bids for additional funding be reinstated? Yeah. Would you be content to pass that on as well? Yeah. Agreed. Yes. Excellent. Okay. Um, move on to the next uh, item: uh, Department of Finance first day brief. I'll draw uh, members' attention to the minister's first day brief at page 63. Requested at the committee at the meeting of the 29th of February 2020, which the Minister readily agreed to. I'd like to advise the members that a more detailed brief was sent by email to members on Monday, which was being issued by the Department in response to an FOI request. The Clerk has requested that the Department provide a clean copy for the committee to consider. Um, committee, I was disappointed to say the least that uh, what the first day brief was provided to us, there was elements of that were redacted. I don't think this is an example of openness and transparency by any stretch of the imagination. And I've asked the clerk to get a clean copy, <coughs> which I haven't seen as yet. So that's different from the one we have in our papers? Uh, yes, sir. It's a more detailed copy, going to a lot more detail on, on the departmental priorities. So I think there were two first day briefs. Chair, I think the, fir the first one was a, a, a short summary in advance of the issue of the, uh, the more detailed brief. I think it's, it's described to us as first day brief. Mm -hmm. It turns out then there was something else. Yeah. And it took an FOI request from some third party to discover that. Yeah. But why was there not transparency with us? Either when we asked the minister, could we see it? Which he said, um, very, we were here and we heard him say. The that permanent we... secretary sitting beside him. <coughs> and then it turns out, but for an FOI request, we wouldn't have known there's a second more detailed document. Correct. New approach, indeed. We got this one. New decade, new approach. Any other further comments, Tim? I think we express our displeasure to the uh, Minister. I'll be writing to him. Agreed. Yeah, All agreed? Agreed. Okay. 
Uh, moving on to item number nine, chairperson's business. Uh, advise members that new tablet device and training hurrah, will be provided to the Committee for Finance members on Wednesday the 26th of February 2020 between 11.30 and 13.30. The venue will be confirmed as soon as possible. I would like to move on to item number 10, correspondence. Ask members to consider the following. Drawing members' attention to an update from the Department on the outworking and successes or otherwise of a voluntary exit scheme on page 75. I would like to seek agreement uh, that we receive copies from the Department of the three evaluations undertaken by PSRD. PSRD. So, just to explain it to Malusa. Sector Reform Division. Say that again. Public Sector Reform Division. Public Sector Reform Division. So, we've got that. <laughs> Actually, uh, just as a, and I know it might sound, um, uh, we are TLA City at the moment, three letter abbreviations, etc. It might be useful in sort of the briefings until the committee after, uh, get, up, get to up to speed if we actually uh, put in what sort of some of these are. Um, uh, to receive a written briefing outlining the issues raised and the suggested actions on page 73 of the papers. To consider this a pa paper again when officials from the <laughs> yes, attend on the 26th of February 2020 and ask for the views of NIPSA, Northern Ireland Public Service Alliance, yes, I got that one, prior to their all-evidence session on the 26th of February. Uh, team, we may wish to consider the NIPSA correspondence alongside the additional correspondence from uh, NIPSA below. Uh, we may wish to discuss inviting NIPSA to give all evidence to the committee on its experience of the voluntary exit scheme. I would quite like to have that, um, I would like to quite have that ev oral evidence from NIPSA but also in some of the previous evidence we had today when we asked the questions of the voluntary exit scheme, it seems to me that there's still um, provision for another round of the voluntary exit scheme potentially, so I think it would be useful if the committee took that evidence or we would be in agreement. Okay. Yeah. I would like to draw the members' attention to correspondence from mid Ulster Council asking the committee to hold a committee meeting on council premises. So it does. Yeah, yeah, I would agree with that. With the, the committee in the past has gone around the country and created a wee bit of interest. I would suggest, if we were talking, uh, on our, if we're talking something particularly to do with uh, that is responsive on tourism or issues to do with that, as well, I imagine the Seamus Heaney Centre might be but useful. I, mm -hmm. if give us an opportunity to both highlight its importance as a tourist centre, and uh, it would be useful for us if we were considering that. You could. To link in with the engineering fraternity down there, it's massive engineering in some sense. Can we uh, take that? So can we take that for a bit further work and exploration, and then yeah. respond to the council as so far? If we're yeah. content with that. Uh, draw attention to the request from the general secretary of NIPSA to address the committee on Northern Ireland civil service pay on page eighty. I think, bearing in mind civil service pay and some of the issues we've been talking about pensions today, I think that would be appropriate. Would we be in agreement with that? Yeah. Great. Uh, I would draw members' attention to the, uh, the following outgoing correspondence and table papers agreed at last week's meeting. Letter to the Minister at Table 5, uh, what about uh, Paul Quinn? A letter to the Quinn family, uh, respectfully, at Table at page 6. And my letter of apology to es Esben Burney at, at, at uh, page seven. Um, I ask members to note those. Are members uh, in agreement content to note the remaining items of correspondence? Noted. Noted. I could ask, has there been no response from the National Crime Agency? Mm, no, I haven't seen that yet. Sorry, Chair. What was the that? National Crime Agency? No response. No, res no response received other than the holding reply. No. Not was of. Two weeks now, is it? Right, give it another one. When's the 14 working days up? Well, they said they would practice last week, so we should have got something. Uh, Jim, would you like us to follow up with them? Uh, yeah, I think it's getting yeah. close to that That's, time, isn't yeah. it? I think, uh, yeah, we're just trying to work out the number of days, but I think if that was something to follow up with them. Mm -hmm. If we move to agenda item 11, draft forward work programme, I'd like to draw members' attention to the updated forward work programme at page 90.
and ask members if they are content with the forward work programme. Yeah. Agreed. Agreed. Yeah. Goodness me. Uh, members of the committee, do we have any other business? Not John. No. Sure. Chair, sure, just uh, ah. I will not be available, as I said, uh, next Wednesday because I have the death of my nephew at the Wood Funeral. So I make an apology now to you, so I will be. Please, on behalf of the committee and my own personal uh, um, sort of condolences, please pass on the condolences to you and your family, Pat. I'm really sorry to Thanks hear that news. Mm, thank you. Okay, uh, a committee uh, time and place next meeting. Uh, do we have pre training next week? At yes, 13.30. At 13.30. Uh, uh, raise briefing at 13.30, then formal committee mm -hmm. at Sorry, 14. Sorry, I raise have indicated to provide uh, papers for that on Friday so members will have a chance to look at them in advance because it does relate to the budget. Okay. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much indeed. Thank you. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29.